All right, just so everybody knows, this is being recorded. We welcome you to the BCPS Secondary Transition uh, Book Talk on eight setbacks that can make a child a success. I'm Lacey Roberts. Hi, and my name is Marta Mullen. Ellen Mullen, if I'm your transition facilitator and you see it, say email and then you're in my email. So we welcome you guys. We um, we are looking forward to sharing this uh, really exciting book that we read uh, and maybe found several tips that we think you might find useful. We're looking forward to that. Um, so we're in that effort. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, the author of this book is M Michelle Icard, and she is talking about parents and their definition of success a lot throughout this book. She encourages parents to look at struggles um, as setbacks with opportunities to grapple with and make meaning of the world around children rather than benchmarks that aren't met. Um, and so much of parents' identity is wrapped up in how our children are doing, and maybe that isn't the best marker of success, uh, that it's more important in how these things are handled than that they are handled. She based a lot of her research on Van Gnemp's study, and that shares that the most successful ways a person moves into adulthood is by passing through four stages, separation from group or pull, pull away emotionally or physically, uh, a time of being tested, learning and growing as a result of the test, and then returning and reintegrating into the group with a better version of oneself. So that's the basis, the research behind the book that she wrote. The very first tip that she gave that we loved and we really found valuable is the whisper network. And basically what a whisper network is, is a group of parents um, that you connect with, that you find through trials and um, what you're going through. When you're going through a setback, saying it out loud um, is the beginning point for parents to start to feel better and you have to find people that you can trust um, or that are able to share resources or connections uh, in the situation you're in currently uh, and the purpose of the whisper network is so that you don't feel alone i and i as a parent have been through this i have looked at a number of things i my kids have a 10-year gap in there so i do totally have like a group of people that i can rely on that i can talk to that i can turn to but i think the most important thing about that is that they're not going to then turn around and start talking about other people about my child to other people what they, we say amongst each other is amongst each other and it's kind of like a we've got this situation so, and I think that's so important, Marta. You make a, a really good point that sometimes we struggle finding our group, um, and it, that's okay too. But to keep searching for that whisper network is crucial when your child is having setbacks. Now, uh, part one of the book is all about getting comfortable with failure. Um, and so I'm opening this up for discussion, either unmute or put your um, answer in the chat if you feel comfortable. Um, tell us about a time when either you failed or your child failed. Um, tell us about it. I will share mine while you're thinking of yours. Um, one time I um, thought I had failed as a parent because the director of the daycare came to me and shared with me that she had some concerns about my household because my daughter, who was two at the time, was um, sharing that she wanted some Hawaiian juice and they were trying to figure out what Hawaiian juice was. Um, and I felt really uncomfortable and I thought I was failing as a parent. Turned out it was Hawaiian punch. Um, so so um, you can understand why that was embarrassing. Um, and one of those parenting moments that gave me uh, pause. Yeah. Um, and Lacey, I've had some similar experiences with that um, as my kids have gotten a little bit older. So um, 
there have been times when like my my older son was not being successful with college at all and i was tearing my hair out i didn't didn't know what i was going to do with him i was like how where are you going what choices are you making and we kind of sat down about it we really realized realized that he just he wasn't really ready at that stage so um he decided that he wanted to kind of like back off but he was going to try one more semester and i was like okay i'm not paying for it <laughs> so he had to take out some student loans and it didn't really make too much of a difference he passed one more class than he had the, the last time but he ended up being able to make a decision that he needed to go to work full time right now and then figure out some life stuff versus like kind of sitting back and just like kind of retaking classes over and over again. And I was really uncomfortable with that. But you know what? He actually paid all his student loan off. And I was like, yes. <laughs> and that made me feel like a million dollars. So sometimes you just gotta wait for that for that little that liner in there where you find out that no I'm okay. It's all right. That's a small one. <laughs> so. Does anyone in the audience have anything to share? It's okay if you don't. I think that all of us have had those moments where we feel like we're failing as a parent um, for various reasons. Some of them humorous like mine, some of them a bit more serious, but we've all been in a situation um, where we have felt like we are failing. There are several traps when you get in this spot that you are supposed to um, try your best to remember. And I know that this is hard, but iCard suggests thinking you can avoid uh, failure by micromanaging your child. Of course, that's not a good technique because it doesn't work. But it might make them pretty angry with you. So <laughs> probably. <laughs> and I'm going to be honest on that one because I do have friends who like look through their child's phone constantly and do that. And I kind of had, I, I have a 10 year gap of kids. So, um, I'm a, I'm a lot less of like micromanaging on a number of things, but it's also just the personality. My older child needed something completely different than my younger child does. My older child needed me to be like the person looking at his grades on a consistent basis and telling him, this is not working. You can't do this. What, where are these assignments? Show me your notebook. Whereas like my younger child, if I do that with him, I'm not going to talk to him for a week after that because it's going to be ugly. And I just have to say to him, well, you need to make a choice here. It's going to end. So it's all about that personality piece. And with him, I can just say, well, if you want to go camping this weekend with the scouts, I think you need to like make a decision about attending that, that coach class. And you know what? I picked him up from coach class yesterday. So. That's wonderful. <laughs> Um, a lot of parents believe failures are rare and they're shamed by them. A lot of them accept that failure can cause damage without accepting it, that it creates space for growth. And a lot of them assert that kids who fail don't have the right to continue failing. Okay. So um, a lot of adolescents do need to like keep their own rights there are certain things that they just have. You have the right to be able to make a mistake. Nobody's perfect. We want you to be able to fix them, but you also need some privacy. You need to be able to take risks at times. Our kids need to be able to take those risks. And sometimes those risks are small, um, trying something different. And sometimes those things are bigger, trying out for the play, you know, choosing their own friends and either in getting together with their peers. That is one of those things that we need our kids to be able to learn how to socialize without us. They also need to practice making informed choices about their bodies. That is things that we may not always agree with everything that's happening, but there are certainly stuff that they get to make a choice about, whether it's piercing your ears or something bigger. So, um, but give them the benefit of doubt. Negotiate with them. Teach them to self-advocate and tell somebody when they do or don't like something. They need to feel like they have their own value. So we need to respect their opinions and the things that they say to us so that they can figure out what's important to them. They need to know what their own values are so that they can stand their ground with that. 
Um, give them some accurate information from multiple perspectives and sources on topics. It is not a one and done situation. They need to hear the different ways, whether we're looking at different sources as far as like, you know, are we looking for something on the internet or do you have a valuable source? Ask them for a source. And they also need to be able to seek independence and not be relied on by their caregivers for personal, emotional, or financial gain. We are not letting our, we are not raising their brothers and sisters. Helping out is one thing, but something completely different can happen too. So, so um, throughout the book, they talk about several different types of um, child and and the setbacks that they might experience. And this this page here, this overcoming failure page, appears in every chapter as steps to resolve or help them move past the initial setback. And it starts with contain, so act with urgency, um, both. Um, about the problem and about what is safe for your child. Um, they talk about resolving to fix the problem, um, but maybe not rush to resolve to fix the problem. Give um, your child some time to input, um, gives adequate input and wait time and time to calm down and all of those things. And then also the last step of this, so it's contain, resolve, evolve. And the E for evolve is to put their failure in the rear view mirror and start to grow from the experience and not be reminded of that failure on a daily basis. Um, the other thing that, that they talk about in several um, sections of this novel is accessing your response style. Um, one of these response styles pretty much fits most cases when your child has a setback. You either fight, take flight, freeze, or fawn. And I, I wasn't really clear what fawn was, so I did some extra reading on that. Um, fight is basically where you get into an argument with your kid. Take flight is where you leave the circumstance and are basically throwing your hands in the air. Freeze is where you do nothing. And fawn is where you try to be as overbearing um, parent um, in the circumstance um, and either fix the problem for the kid or you overly exert um, adultness in a child's problem. If um, Remember, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And remember, you can't use your brain if your body is on fire. So... So these are some strategies to um, help your child move through um, the different um, situations that they'll encounter. Always affirm your child. Always shrink your child's exposure to whatever it is. If it's something online, if it's something on TV, if it's, if it's a group of friends, shrink their exposure. Gather the truth from multiple sources. I cannot stress to you enough how important it is to gather the truth from multiple sources. Had my daughter's daycare worker not done that, we would have never found out what type of drink my daughter was seeking, and we all would have had these bizarre thoughts. Um, take action once you have um, the truth from multiple sources. Um, the, this next part, this is actually part two. We're going to go through each one of the types of failure for you so that you can see um, how the, the, this particular situation actually lends itself to being successful, maybe to help you rewrite your thinking um, and perhaps um, see how you can move it to a more positive space for your child. Yeah. So one of the first ones that we look at is the one who just doesn't follow the rules, the rebel. You know, a lot of times you think, people think of like, a, if you're my age, maybe you think of James Dean. So um, James Dean and, you know, the rebel, the one that just kind of broke all the rules. But that's not really necessarily what we're looking at here. So the reason the kids are starting to kind of challenge us and be able to break some of those rules and kind of ask themselves a lot of questions has to do with their age and their ability to process certain things. When you are five years old, it is black and white. It is right or is wrong. There is not a lot of give and take in that. But as you start to get a little bit older, you're looking at 
some shades of gray. Okay, so maybe we're not going to lie to our friend, but maybe we won't tell them we don't like their hair at all. Okay, some different things. They're able to kind of start processing things hypothetically and then looking at that. So some of the examples that you're going to see would be missing curfew, lying, cheating, stealing, breaking things, not telling you the truth about it. It's going to happen. How we address it is going to matter. Okay, um, we should start to worry if it's chronic. We should start to worry if your child also never breaks the rules to that though. Part of the reason that we might wanna say that is because why are they trying so hard to make everyone else happy? What are they afraid of? What's happening when you're not looking? If your child is never pushing back, never questioning anything, are the rules so hard and firm in the first place that they're afraid to ask that, can we change this? Can we try something different? So um, that's gonna be one of the things that will make a big difference in how your child reacts to this. The example that they used in the book was a child who had done like a TikTok that was definitely gonna get her into trouble in school, didn't cause any major problems or inconveniences for anybody, but she ended up getting suspended over it because it was a TikTok that showed her breaking a rule and she got caught because multiple people shared that. So we want, her and this child who looked at it to get to the point where we can look at that silver lining. We want them to be able to encourage change when change is needed, but we also want them to look at rules. They don't have to agree with every rule, but they certainly need to find out if that rule is reasonable and then teach them to direct their energy towards something that's a little bit more worthwhile, something that you've researched, something that you've considered a little bit more carefully. Because once your child has that first major consequence and you're breaking it down, I can be sure. I know that after having broken the curfew a few different times and then I didn't get to go out the next couple of times because of that, there was a chance for me to sit back and reflect, well, if I want to be able to go out, I need to make sure I'm catching the right bus to get home in time. So, and that's exactly what happened because my parents were like, well, I guess it was more important for you to stay out that extra hour than it was for you to stay, to be able to go out next Friday and Saturday. And I did not like that. <laughs> so next weekend I was home or the following weekend, once I got past it, I was totally on home one time. Okay. This one's a little scary and this is the daredevil. Sometimes they just do things where they don't put themselves in danger. And it can be frightening. Sometimes it's something little. Maybe they're skating without a without knee pads and elbow pads. Bigger fear would be skating, roller skating, or, or skateboarding and not having a helmet on. You know what the dangers are. They can't think of it that way. Okay, but we also see alcohol use at this stage, alcohol abuse, not following the safety rules, driving, okay, sports, reckless actions, poor food choices, lying, take, there's a lot of stuff that can happen in this particular area. Um, you need to consider as to what the action was. In the text, in the book that we looked at, um, this particular book, they talked about a child who had drank themselves to the point of blacking out. Do we know that this happens sometimes? Absolutely. It was a terrifying experience for these parents. Absolutely terrifying because they ended up having to go to the emergency room, go through the whole thing. But you do need to let the child recover from this. After they stopped getting a ton of phone calls from everybody and all of the rumors that happened at school, this is part of like, how do you kind of shrink this back down to bring this to a realistic position? Okay. So in this situation, you need to make sure that your whisper network is there and you need to make sure that you are talking to other people who have been through similar situations and you wanna ask questions about what happened. In a situation like this, it may not be your child who can give you the answers because they were obviously not doing what they were supposed to be doing. They weren't, having a, they weren't at a party just to have fun. They had gone and drank so much that they had gotten black and blacked out. Was there an adult there? Yes. Was the adult fully aware? Obviously not, because that was a terrifying situation for everyone. Okay, but we want them to be able to come back where to reality. You know, how quickly do you manage this is going to depend a lot on each child. Okay, but you need to look at the act itself, decide what is going to happen. So a lot of times it's an impulsivity. 
They did not stop and think before the action, okay? They're in front of their friends. Sometimes they don't feel like they can back down. And then if they start lying, that and that happens a lot as they start going up into their preteen years and they're not willing to like open up and consider a consider the truth, okay? Um, if this is a, the kind of thing that's happening on a consistent basis though, absolutely. This would be something, especially if it's involving drinking or drugs or alcohol, you would want to involve your pediatrician, pediatrician or other professional help in there. Okay? You want to be able to make sure that child comes back, recognizes that the decisions that they were making were impulsive, okay? that they were not in their best effort, and that you want to be able to make sure that they are going to be moving on from this on a consistent basis and learn that making that choice, again, is not going to happen. Okay. The other thing I want to mention here is we know that the prefrontal cortex, um, a lot of the decision making in this period of time, um, the prefrontal cortex in the brain is not fully developed. So you can expect some of this behavior um, and, and not maybe thinking through as much as you had hoped as normal. Um, it, it's when it reaches a level of excess um, or significant um, bodily harm that um, some of those red flags should start going off for you to get additional support. Absolutely. Cool. All right. So, and we also know a lot of kids who are that loner hanging out by themselves. They are rejecting us to some extent. No, I don't want to hang out with you parents tonight. Um, you know, my son's hanging out with you. I'm like, you're upstairs. He's like, I'm busy. <laughs> and then we hear him later. So we know he is socializing. Um, but it's not always in groups. So sometimes he's like, chatting with somebody on the computer and we can hear it and we know what's going on. But sometimes kids start to feel that they are alone in a crowd. So we're looking for patterns that show an inability to, they're not interested in hanging out with friends. Okay. Um, sometimes you see it as avoiding places that they used to like or events that they used to do. Maybe they've changed their hobbies. Uh, they, maybe they don't want to go do that Taekwondo thing anymore. Um, part of this is really going to be about learning what fits for you. What do you like? This is really should be the exploration here should be like that, figuring out what I do and don't like. Okay? There are certainly people who are in adolescence who become very funny and resilient adults later, but they need to find their crowd and they may not be finding it right now. That does not mean they won't find their crowd, but continue to let them explore and let them look at it. If you do start to see that the friendships that you are, are frequently, they're looking for something constantly that they're not quite finding and they're being rejected by friends or peers like that, you may want to start to look at that a little bit, a little bit more different from a different perspective. If you find that your child is not always being included and you're struggling with that, with wanting them to be included, it may not be the best step for you to then jump in and try and figure it out. Maybe they need to be able to look at it from a different perspective and then try to expand some of their interests a little bit so that they can find other people who like the same things that they do. And one of the cautions here is um, if you try to overcorrect or um, maybe um, fixate on them not having the right type of friends, they may over fixate themselves and it might become almost like an obsession um, on friendships and how they don't have friendships and it might actually make things worse. So you want to caution yourself um, in that role just to mention to them gently that, you know, you'll find your tribe when you do, it'll be great. Um, but you're amazing now. Um, and you have lots of people you could talk to. Um, and soon you'll find a group of friends. Um, I wouldn't um, over focus um, them on the lack of friendships. Yeah. And I, I think the other thing that I would also say with that too, Lacey, is that you are not going to like all of your kids' friends. There are certainly going to be, <laughs> there are going to be kids you don't like and you're like, why would they pick that one? That, ha that does happen. And 
if we overcorrect in that situation, then we can end up being very attached to that particular friend, but really cutting us out. So I want to watch for that one. That okay. happens a lot. You're right, Marta. <laughs> <laughs> and it's hard when you're like watching something and you're going, why is this happening? And you want to step in so much so. And then you you just let them experience the friendship. They usually make the best choices after all. They'll kind of like sit back a little bit and analyze a few things that have happened once or twice and recognize that person is not really their friend. So, and that also goes with romantic relationships. The worst thing um, uh, that can be done is for you to say, oh, I hate so-and-so, blah, 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 blah. Because, of course, teenagers instantly want to rebel. And so then that becomes um, something that they won't get rid of just to spite you rather than them making a good choice. Uh -huh. um, so be mindful of that as well. I think that's a really good point. So... All right. Um, okay. So one of our next ones looks at the sensitive, the sensitive child, the one who is always worried about hard feelings. They struggle with it. Everything is a big feeling. There is no in between. Okay. What you want to be careful here is, is it your child's emotions or your emotions? Is Are they picking up on yours? If they are constantly melting down and melting down and you're seeing yourself do that as well, then sometimes you need to might need to take that step back and focus on your own emotional needs a little bit because as a parent, I have certainly seen things happen and I'm like trying not to explode in front of my child. And that is hard. That is definitely that. Um, our kids are lurking and looking at a time now where they're starting to see themselves a little bit differently. They look at the world in a different place. They have different opinions and they do not have to agree with everything they, that we do. Um, we can see kids becoming hyper-focused on social media. So like the TikTok videos, um, you know, Facebook is really our generation. So, but I know that TikTok is, is going to be the other one. My son uses a Discord account. Um, if they can't let those things go, you do need to think about whether or not how we can help them with that. Um, we can learn stability though. We can absolutely learn how to manage our emotions and make choices as to whether or not something is, should I, where should I be on the explosion scale in this situation? They can learn together, talk to other friends or parents who have like figured something out. You whisper network will certainly help you with this and say, oh, I remember when Janie did this. I remember when John had this happen. They do help out and then they kind of calm us down and i think in this situation kind of calming ourselves down a little bit is what gives our chance our kids a chance to be able to develop that coping mechanism be able to like figure out okay do i need to be super upset do i need to like kind of bring it down and then making those decisions okay um it can go too far so you do need to start thinking about if um, you're seeing suicidal ideation or engaging it in some sort of danger that they cannot come back from. If you see those things and you want to reach out for some additional support from either a counselor or a therapist or your pediatrician. Another thing that someone taught me uh, a long ago, a teacher I worked with, she taught me that in her house, they always um, stop when they're having big emotions and they determine whether it should be a big emotion or a little emotion. Um, and basically big emotions should be reserved for things like life and death and major um, experiences. And then most everything else fits into the little emotions category. So if you're having a child that's struggling determining what is um, appropriate for their feelings inside, that might be a little tip for you to help them sort that. I can even see that being as like a teaching thing, Lacey, where you kind of like take some of the events and stuff like that and sort them into where emotions should fit. So, you know, breaking up with your boyfriend, is it a big emotion or a little emotion, you know, or versus like, I couldn't go out Thursday night because I had a sure. school project, you know, something else going on. But I think that kids need to see and feel that difference too. So talk about that. 
Okay. Sure. Right. And I also think that it's a good point here to make while we're discussing it, that every kid is going to be different. And so how you relate to your child may be um, different and you may have to use some different strategies with each individual child based on their circumstances. We, we just want you to know that a lot of these things are normal um, and actually end up with a silver lining if um, handled um, in the best way possible. Okay, so we do have a question from a parent that asks about how to help a child who has difficulty with making friends. And I think that that's really hard for me. My son, it, I just felt like he never, he doesn't invite people over to our house. I'm like, who are your friends? Who do you hang out with? And when I would ask him about what was, what was going on at school, he was like, well, I don't have anybody to sit with at lunch today, so I just go to the library. You know, and really small, isolated, and I was kind of worried about it. Um, we did, we do participate in two group things that have made a big difference for us. Um, one of them was a complete accident and the other one was intentional and in that we started scouts when he was young. So he has been able to maintain a group with a group of friends with scouts and they do things in school. Clubs, having your child get involved in a club inside of the school setting can be a huge thing because it's no longer the focus on finding a friend. The focus is gonna be much more on that activity. Figure out what activities they like to do and then try and have like the activity be the focus on versus, oh, you're gonna go do this so that you can make friends. Does that help a little bit? Yeah, I would not put the focus on the making of friends, but rather the doing things that you find fun. So for mm -hmm. example, if you have a kid that's into hiking, go hiking with them. Um, and then if you see other kids, tell them, oh man, I really like that. Why don't you find out what kind of, what kind of, um, walking stick they're using? Why don't you find out what kind of shoes they're using? Um, and just do it naturally as it occurs. Uh, you may have to do some um, creative um, exploration with your child to help find some things that they're interested in. Um, another strategy I've heard is um, parents will uh, just make their kids go to events at the school like, okay, I know you're not into dances, but you do like plays. So I'm going to make you go to the play. Um, and maybe in going to the play, um, there might be somebody there that you talk to that ends up becoming a relationship, or I might make you pass out the brochures so that you are around other people who also like plays and musicals. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think some of the after school clubs and stuff like that give kids a safe place where they're not necessarily in school anymore, but they have something happening. Um, sports can also be another piece, whether that's going to be through the school or it's going to be outside of the school. Look for opportunities for them to do the things that they want without focusing on the friendship piece. They will find their tribe. They will find a few friends that, that and sometimes it's a very small group of friends. Um, I think that I can count like five friends for my son on one hand, and that's pretty much it. He doesn't talk to other people. He doesn't socialize with other people outside of that group. And even sometimes like that, like if we go somewhere, he won't necessarily talk to other people when, with us. It's just kind of his personality, and we need to be able to respect, respect that a little bit. Okay. All right. Um, so the black sheep. Okay. Failure to get along with family. Wow. Um, okay. Brothers and sisters. <laughs> um, definitely kind of trying to separate a little bit from the family a little bit. Um, when they want to be different. Okay. Um, maybe they don't fit into the mold a little bit different or choosing to do different things. Maybe they're having a harder time and they're being more argumentative. Um, sometimes it's the child wanting to seek some independence. Maybe they're being more independent and they're trying to like kind of pull themselves towards that independence a little bit fast. And they want to do some of those bolder things and some of those great ideas and try some different stuff. Um, but it's going to depend. Some of it is definitely, they need to be able to have some guidelines as to how far they can go with this. Um, certainly, if you we're not having violence against family members, intentionally hurting each other, whether it's with words or um, being disrespectful, lying about things that are happening, or 
if other people are in the household are afraid of that child um, and what they might say and do and hiding from them, legal consequences, definitely. Those would be our, those would be our red flags. Those are the areas where we're going, okay, this isn't working the way we want it to, okay? Um, the silver lining is that we want them to grow. We want them to start pushing at some of those boundaries a little bit. We can definitely see that they're going to be different from us, but sometimes that sometimes it's us. <laughs> sometimes we're kind of holding on a little bit and we need to consider relaxing some of our boundaries a little bit. I think that that's one of the things that I found is that I kind of want to know what's happening and I think I'm just nosy. So, but it's partly being a parent. I want to know what's happening and what's going on. Um, if it's becoming a major problem, then certainly there is no reason why a therapist wouldn't be a good option. And whether that's a good option for the child who's becoming the black sheep or the child who is who's feeling bullied by the, um, the black sheep or the parents to be able to manage it differently. Any one of us can end up using and making, finding much more success with having a, a therapist available to us. I also think if you are seeing symptoms of uh, loner behavior or black sheep behavior, either in school with their peers or at home with you, um, a good stop might be to the guidance counselor in your child's school. Um, and another free option would be the social worker. They could probably give you some tips and tricks um, from their tool bag and their experiences that might far exceed what we're able to go into here. I think that's a good point reminding us that we are definitely, our schools have much more of a, a village feel today. Your kids have multiple teachers. All of them have some sense of like caring and investment in your child. And I think that we all need to be able to take advantage of that at some times. So I'm going to talk to you guys about failure to believe in oneself, the bench warmer, the one that lacks confidence, has low self-esteem, um, cheers from the sidelines, tries to avoid taking risks, um, the one that self-doubts their actions, avoids opportunities so that they won't be embarrassed, um, self Determination and self-confidence are learned skills, um, but often they're not learned from a parent. Um, sometimes they need the help of, like we were talking about, a guidance counselor or a social worker or a therapist. But kids who need to learn self-confidence are often positive role models and mentors for others because they notice that, hey, I lacked the confidence, but I gained it over time. And they like to share that with others because it is a pretty tumultuous time for them. And um, they have a, a strong sense of identity and pride in overcoming that part of adolescence. So that's the silver lining there. Um, some things to watch out for are obviously self-doubt um, that leads to suicidal ideations and those types of things. Um, then you would need to involve a professional right away. Okay. Now, I think that we've all experienced this particular one, which is the failure to perform well in school, um, the misfit. Okay. So when, child, when your child is struggling in school, socially, academically, both, okay? I think that what we really want to do is make sure that we are controlling the narrative a little bit, okay? A lot of times our kids in these areas, are, they're completely aware of their difference. If a child has either a 504 plan or an IEP plan in place, consider talking with them about it. You know, starting when they turn 14, we include them in the IEP team. They are a full-fledged member of the team. They should be participating with us. If they're not there at the team, ask where they are, okay? Um, include them in the discussions about what works and what doesn't work. Now, maybe that means that I'm not, I will invite them to the team, but I may not discuss all of the testing and assessment and format because that can be a lot and feel very overwhelming. That can be, I was in a meeting the other day and the child wanted to stay for all of that, but that's rare. So they're fully aware of what's going on, that they're struggling with something, but it's not something that you want to ever hide a diagnosis from a child that may make them feel like it's something they need to hide forever. Especially, we know these are not things that are necessarily going away, okay? It's something they need to share with a few people, but they need to learn the strategies that are gonna work for them. They need to be able to identify that these are strategies they're gonna be using forever. Okay, these are things that they, once they start figuring these things out, it's going to be a benefit for them. 
Well, the silver lining to this though is that they have already struggled. They know that there are barriers, there are things that are not perfect for everyone and that they can still succeed and grow under the same circumstances, okay? So when they find that new path, they have a new strategy that works for them, they can share it, they can talk about it. It's gonna take them a little bit longer to get through and figure out what pathway. Maybe they have to switch around a little bit and figure out some different things. But just knowing that you figured out that that we have a learning disability or we have an, a social anxiety or we have something going on that needs to have that extra support. Knowing that as a child, I have many friends who have found out later in life, oh, well, that, yes, that is ADHD. That is a <laughs> symptom of ADHD. Yes, that is a symptom of, of, being, of being on the spectrum. I have had friends who have been identified as being on the autism spectrum. I've had friends identified as having significant ADHD. And you know what? They've had to suddenly kind of step back and look at themselves in a different way. And they say, wow, hey, you know, I made it through school. I made it without some of the supports and things that I can have now. So does it mean that they're going to have all of those supports? No, forever? Maybe not. But what they will have is going to be the Americans with Disabilities Act. Okay, That is never going to go away from them. And that's something they will always have. So even after they get out of high school and they're in college, that IEP, that 504 plan, that diagnosis is something that can be put into place to help them develop and grow forever. So... I think that was probably the one that was harder for me to kind of identify here, partially because I've seen my own child struggle dramatically with them um, within having a 504 plan and having that significant ADD. You know, that we, we've we learned to tease about it a little bit now, but we would say rabbit, and he would suddenly turn his head and pay attention because that's how, how easily distracted he was over most things. And that was very challenging for him to be able to manage. So another so, one um, is the failure to show concern for others, the ego. Um, this student it, or this child is typically self-centered and focused only on their own needs. This starts at around age 11 and continues through their 20s. This stage is hard because um, they're seeking their own identity outside of their family or um, the parent world. Teens need time to be able to practice individualization. And um, some examples of this might be self phone centered friends first um, mentality. Like they don't want to um, collaborate with the family. They want to be with their friends. They want to hide in their bedroom. They want to rarely emerge um, until they want something. Um, and in con the controlling the narrative phase, um, we say, treat them as the person you hope they'll become and schedule time to discuss and address the specific actions you have seen. Use I statements wherever possible. Um, this is a two-way street, of course. Your, your child may learn this so well that they turn it around and do it um, with you. Um, and you need to ask why they're upset. Um, I don't understand why you're angry. Have that dialogue with them openly and honestly. When this goes too far, teens are repeatedly or intentionally hurting someone else. It goes beyond the home um, and it avoids spending time with others. The silver lining is that many leaders um, with confidence and resolve come from um, this setback. Does anyone have any questions? I see that there is one open, um, Ms. Abu Bakr. Yes, I had a question. Um, I heard you mention the 504. Um, does everyone need a 504? Because I was told that if you had the IEP, that was more important than the 504. So it's not about what's more important. It's about what the student needs. Um, however, you don't get both at the same time. They're, they're governed under different laws. So if you have an IEP, you would not 
qualify for a 504. You have one or the other, but they do similar things. The IEP is a, a more beefy document, if you will, and covers, encompasses more things than a 504, but they're both designed to fill the gaps and help students um, with deficits that they have. Thank you for explaining it. Yeah, I think the way that I look at the IEP is that my son had a 504 plan. He needed to have some accommodations. He needed extended time. Sometimes he would need to have to have notes from a teacher. Um, maybe he would have to be seated in a place where he was close by the teacher. But he did not have academic gaps that were keeping him that much further from his peers. Um, if he had needed to have academic gaps, then we would have absolutely needed to put a 504, an IEP in pla into place. So, and that would have specific goals leading to, um, I don't know how, leading to wanting to have a child gain the skills that they were missing. Okay, so we came from Pennsylvania where you could have both. So, um, but in the district that we were in, the way they, or the school he was in, the way that they used it was uh, you had an IEP, but you were only qualified for the 504 if you had a physical disability. So, um, but all those extra things that you just spoke of are included within his IEP. So now I, I really understand the difference. Thank okay, you. that's good. I'm glad that helped a little bit. Okay, all right. All right. So um, we have about 12 minutes left in our presentation. And before we get to wrapping it up, I wanted to open the floor for you guys to see if you had any, any other questions or had anything to share that has really worked for your child in one of the setbacks. No? Anyone? Okay. Do you want to wrap it up, Marta, or you want me to? I'll take it from here. But okay. just keep in mind that, yeah, they're going to make mistakes. It's going to happen. Everybody makes mistakes. None of us is perfect. Um, this will, The stages that we're looking at here will also end, okay? It is so hard to be in the moment. But as our kids grow and change, we will still be there. We are not giving up on them just because they have these setbacks and phrase things. So let them learn and manage their struggles now. While they are with us, we can support them and let them know that it is not the end of the world. I have a million different things in my head that I can think back to, like, I can't believe I did that. But there were all, most of those things happened when I was a child. And I was able to kind of recover and move on and recognize that that was not going, that it was a little bump on the road and not a major thing. Um, did some major stuff happen? Absolutely. What did I recover from it? Did I decide that no things are not going to be that bad and I can move on from here? Yes. Um, my parents were, we moved a lot as a child. So, and with moving a lot, sometimes it felt like they didn't have the same kind of whisper network and the same group of parents on a consistent basis. But there is always going to be a group that will be available to you. There are always going to be a few people that you can kind of work with. As to where you find them, it's going to depend. Look for your friends and neighbors and kids, people with other kids the same age. Um, but we can support other parents and other children through their failures so that they can grow from their mistakes. And that's what this whole book was about. And I actually have a copy of the book here to show you. Whoops, is it going to let you? <laughs> Probably I have my background on. All right, if I put it over my face, I think it'll look at, it'll let you see it for a minute. <laughs> so, but um, I have found a number of very helpful things from this particular author. Michelle Eichert has been able to develop a number of things that I've been very pleased with. And I just thought they they talk to me a little bit. So. Okay. All right. Does if anybody else has any other questions or things like that, we do have a few minutes left. And we can stick around. Um, I can stop um, sharing recording. the presentation and stop recording um, if that would be helpful. I think that would be. Okay. okay. Give me just a second. I'm going to stop recording and then um, you can ask 
um, whatever questions you have, okay? That way your questions won't be recorded.